Cormac McCarthy fans, we would have never gotten Sutri and Blood Meridian if Cormac McCarthy's crazy idea to become a screenwriter actually worked. And in the late 1970s, while McCarthy was working on Sutri and Blood Meridian, he created this massive diversion in his career, which is one of the more bizarre aspects of his biography to become a screenwriter and once it was all said and done he had multiple unpublished screenplays a failed Faulkner adaption project and in its somewhat bitter attitude toward cinema that wouldn't be restored until the Coen brothers saved the day in the mid 2000s and today we're going to be tracking McCarthy's history as a screenwriter with some of those lost interviews that were brought to light last year and in the early, excuse me, in 1976, while McCarthy was living in Tucson, he was employed to write The Gardener's Son, which is a Southern Gothic screenplay with Gnostic themes. And speaking of Gnosticism, I am hosting free daily discussions on Cormac McCarthy on my Cormac McCarthy Substack now, everybody, because I am here to take out the dying Cormac McCarthy subreddit. I want engaging conversations on the deepest aspects of Cormac McCarthy's writing, philosophy, biography, whatever, and not photos of people's book collections and random questions about, blood, uh, about Judge Holden being Lucifer. And so at 6 a.m. every day, I'm going to be posting... A free discussion, and today's topic is Judge Holden, rambling seducer or prophet. And I would love to see you guys over there because the medium is the message, and using a platform that isn't Reddit or even YouTube will create more engaging responses and ideas. It'll be easier to read and post. And this is my way of hopefully reviving a lot of of the independent scholarship I know is out there because so many of you guys are smarter than any PhD out there. You guys or way, 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 no, excuse me, no, way more about Cormac McCarthy than I do. So I'd love to see you guys over there. And once again, they'll be being posted if you don't, if you're not interested in today's topic at 6 a.m. Pacific time. And here's McCarthy giving a pretty deep description about the screenplay, which is interesting because around, around this time, he wasn't really against talking about his work. When you look at a lot of these lost interviews, he's somewhat open to discussing them. It wasn't until he went and started hanging out with scientists and he got this weird new attitude that he didn't want to talk about it anymore. And so, quote, we're reading the right column. The McAvoys, the poor family whose son Robert killed the mill owner, Greg, were Irish Catholics living in a southern town like my family was, McCarthy said. Everyone else was Methodist or Baptist. Robert McAvoy grows up being a black sheep, the bad boy of the town. That was familiar to me, too. The kid was a natural rebel, probably just a troublemaker in real life. But in our film, he has a certain nobility. He stands up and says, no, this is intolerable, and I want to do something about it. When have you ever heard McCarthy talk about a character like that and talk about himself in relation to a character, basing a character off of his own personal life? And that's somewhat of the core of The Gardener's Son. And I have a version of The Gardener's Son movie. Uh, I have The Gardener's Son movie on my channel if you guys want to go check it out. Uh, some light spoilers here. Kind of the main plot is that there's this mill in the town and it's exploiting the workers as, as always. And one of the mill owners kind of gets a little bit touchy, a little bit weird with one of the multi-generational family mill workers, young daughter. And so the brother kills the mill owner and there's a trial and all this stuff happens and it gives an opportunity for McCarthy to kind of philosophize. But what's interesting about this was that McCarthy didn't just get commissioned to come and do this because like I said, McCarthy at this time had been living in Tucson for years at this point. And so he flies back to Tennessee and is intimately working with the production of the movie, including casting extras and being there for the entire thing, as we're about to hear McCarthy say. And we're at the top right now. Quote, Richard Pierce, director of the film, and the person who asked McCarthy to write it, said McCarthy was, an intimate, was as intimately involved in the project as a writer can be. When I was casting bits and extras, he came along. We saw over a thousand people throughout the state of South Carolina, and he came to every session. For his part, McCarthy admitted he, quote, wanted to see what films were all about. It's backbreaking work. On location for 30 days, and the last week we were working 16 to 18 hours a day. You've got to be some kind of weirdo to think that's, that it's fun, but it sure kept my interest up. 
and and writers are basically pretty lazy people. And just a quick aside, if you look at the top of the, of the screen again, McCarthy actually talks about writing somewhat candidly. Quote, I don't know why I started writing, he said laconically. I don't know why anybody does it. Maybe they are bored or failures at something else. Look at Spiro Agnew. He's now a novelist. Nevertheless, McCarthy said life could have been grimmer. I've had fellowship and, and scholarships to help me eke out a living as a writer. I find when I'm really comfortable and have a little money, I tend to relax too much. Whereas when my feet are in the fire, I tend to get up early and go to work. So it seems like McCarthy likes to work in that form of scarcity, kind of that fear polarization when it comes to making money and getting his art done, like the starving artist trope. But it's interesting that he was on location for 30 days for filming, but also did all the uh, scouting for the film locations and for all the actors also. And McCarthy sensed that this was a major break for him. Because once he gets home from this project, once this endeavor is over, uh, the year after, he starts writing multiple drafts of a screenplay called Cities of the Plain that wouldn't find light until about 15 years later with All the Pretty Horses. And we know now that he did try to get this published, did try to get this moving, but The Gardener's Son was a straight-to-television movie. It did win, I think, an Emmy. It did do all right, and people seemed to like it and give it good reviews back in the day. But not enough for McCarthy, who once again is living in Tucson slash El Paso, sometimes being back in Tennessee at the time. He's not living in Hollywood. He's not walking the walk and like really trying to make those connections. But wait, there's more. He actually did, because a couple of years later in 1980, after his failed Cities of the Plain screenplay, McCarthy wanted to adapt As I Lay Dying by William Faulkner. And he says, quote, movies are often memorable for a few scenes. Actually, let me read you guys a whole quote. It's at the bottom. This is one of Faulkner's books that I, would th I think would lend itself greatly to film, says McCarthy. Movies are often memorable for a few scenes, and I believe As I Lay Dying would have a great cinematic appeal. And so McCarthy starts writing a screenplay of As I Lay Dying, which we do not have. That is gone the way of the dodo bird, unfortunately. And McCarthy was taking this project seriously because he employed and was working with a businessman named Frank Hare, who was somewhat funding the film, like trying to get it off the ground with McCarthy. So here's McCarthy with uh, somehow he finds a funder, aka a producer, and Richard Pierce, who directed The Gardener's Son, was going to do it with McCarthy once again. And here's actually an interesting photo of McCarthy in this article that's talking about this there on the left, which is a ridiculous photo. But to get this movie off the ground, they needed $1.25 million, which back in 1980 would be about $5 million today. And quote, the plans for the movie include a $1.25 million budget to begin production in March of 81 if money becomes available. As the film is planned now, it will be a movie for television, possibly released to theaters later on, says McCarthy. I can't imagine not being able to sell this movie in Kentucky, says Hare. It's a really prestigious project that would be perfectly filmed in eastern Kentucky. It's strictly a blue chip project. Unlike the case of major film companies, financing for independent projects is often hard to secure. Steal, a movie filmed entirely in Lexington, now showing at Lexington Theaters, was an independently produced movie in which it starred Lee Majors invested heavily. And so, unfortunately, the movie never came out. And even more unfortunately... Goddamn James, sorry, James is in my way. Goddamn James Franco was, made an adaption in 2013, which was an absolute failure. His adaption of As They Lie Dying, a book I love, failure. Child of God, sucked. Uh, Zeroville by Steve Erickson, absolute crap. The Sound and the Fury, crap. I mean, he has done, I mean, he is the only person, well, there are a lot of people who have been canceled, I've not had a problem with but when i heard that he was le he was retiring and taking time away i was like take take a couple decades please and so what's interesting about mccarthy's screenplays is that it's a whole other medium right like you think you can write a novel you can do screenplays or if you do screenplays you can write a novel or do this and that and when you look at the whole progression because i've been to the archive and read the original no country for uh, not you know well i've read the original no country for old men the original cities of the plains whales and men and there's something missing in a lot of them, even uh, the Sunset Limited, which I love, and the Stonemason. Uh, when we look at the whole catalog, it doesn't give McCarthy the space he needs. McCarthy never wrote short stories. Like, why didn't we see most authors out there have more than two short stories? And he stopped in college. Even big authors like Don DeLillo and Haruki Murakami, they still work in the short story field every once in a while. 
But as I've kind of talked about before, McCarthy relies on nature so much. And when we look at whales and men, that's what he tried to integrate. So like whales and men, about these uh, scientists who are trying to save the whales and do all this stuff. And a lot of it's based on nature and they're reflecting on nature. But when you're writing a screenplay, you have a lot of constraints because one of McCarthy's strengths is like his rants. We see these characters like telling these long stories. Like it's very apparent in The Crossing, but even books like... Out of Dark or The Orchard Keeper. Every single McCarthy novel has these characters going on these kind of random stories, but are really symbolic in the long run. And these are reinforced by the nature scenes and the mood and the beautiful writing. But as I'm sure a lot of you guys know, like the written word doesn't translate to the spoken word, especially in novel form. It has to be adapted because if you just uh, read writing out loud, it doesn't really translate, translate that well, especially with some of the crazy vocabulary of McCarthy. And because you can't, sit and describe nature in the McCarth in, in a screenplay. You can't use symbolism, nature, and language to build interiority. McCarthy has to build interiority on his own, o- alone with dialogue. And that's something he never do- does in any of his novels. Maybe The Passenger and Stella Maris is use interiority. So he's here as a screenwriter and has to make characters relatable when not that many of his characters are very relatable. To us, you know, uh, distraught men who are lost in the world trying to seek knowledge, gnosis, and love, and all these other things. They are our favorite characters. But to the average person who's going to sit down and watch a movie, uh, a lot of these characters are not very appealable. And so in, for instance, The Cities of the Plains screenplay, John Grady Cole and Billy Parham, like when, when I read through that, they, have, they had none of that same energy. I was projecting everything I knew from the first two novels on them while reading the screenplay. It was more just like kind of a classic tragedy. And that's all you can really do. But then when we see he has the opportunity to expand in All the Pretty Horses and The Crossing, they become masterpieces. We fall in love with these characters because of those other elements that give them a sense of of purpose and meaning. So I think Whales and Men was abandoned because it was like The Passenger. McCarthy in his old age wanted to publish The Passenger because he had been working on it for 60 years, and I honestly think he should have. And he refined a lot of the elements that were, or excuse me, that could have made it not great. But in Wales of Men, it was too ranty. It was too scientific. You know, that's kind of a critique of Stella Maris. There wasn't really this uh, major plot going on that helped carry the story. And that's already a big no-no. Look at the response to The Passenger and Stella Maris and how people didn't like it in a novel. But that's, you know, a couple hundred pages, that's a no-no. But if you put that, try to put that in the screenplay, it's really not going to work. So when I look at McCarthy's first half of his screenwriting career, from The Gardener's Son to Whales and Men, I see someone who is struggling, who really isn't very good and hasn't really gotten too deep into the art form yet. And I guess I'm lying because in the late 1980s after Whales and Men, McCarthy actually did uh, write The Stonemason. And it's an interest, and The Stonemason is interesting because it gave McCarthy, McCarthy finally kind of figured out an idea on how to get his ideas out there. Because with this approach, with some of his weaknesses and stuff, you have to write a certain type of story. And Ben Telflair, this stonemason who decides not to go to college, really is just monologuing and like putting ideas out there. And we, we kind of learn, and it's kind of mixed in with a narrative about what happened. So there's a tragedy that's interlaced with some monologuing on some spiritual things, but nothing is too deep. He's not sitting there and going on about... um girdle or uh oppenheim or anything he's it's it's pretty light spiritual stuff that has some symbolic meaning which i think is one of mccarthy's strengths and the stonemason it is not the best thing mccarthy has written but one way that it's different is it actually is an uplifting work most of the time we kind of see this negative arc with mccarthy and maybe at the end there's like some blissful enlightenment like we see in the crossing all the pretty horses passenger the orchard keeper a lot of that stuff there's kind of this revelation even if it's weird at the end but in the stone age mason we kind of hit see him hit this big arc and so after he finishes the stone mason mccarthy goes and starts working on all the pretty horses pulling back from a screenplay so we could say that mccarthy once he started working on screenplays in 77 was intimately connected to them for the rest of his life and so after he blows up with all of his fame and all the pretty horses eventually he starts writing no, the no country for old men screenplay which if I will say to you guys now, is much different. If McCar- if the Coen brothers used that screenplay, because we had that screenplay and he turned it into a novel eventually, much like the Border Trilogy, but it would not have won an Academy Award. McCarthy's screenplay is vastly different than what Scott Myers did with the adapted screenplay. And once again, it's because some of the 
characterization, the dialogue, a lot of the stuff with McCarthy is very wonky and wasn't going to be is, isn't going to be, re- be received that well with modern audiences. And that's why uh, the Sunset Limited, if we're moving on now to this, we're moving on to the end of McCarthy's career, had to go straight to an HBO release. And the Sunset Limited was never meant to be as two guys talking in a room. It's never meant to be some blockbuster hit. But that's where I feel like McCarthy almost peaks as a screenwriter because he kind of accepts what's going on. He's like, okay, this doesn't need to be anything great. This can be just two guys talking in this kind of philosophical way. I can kind of, I could polarize them in the most simple terms of black and white and move through two different modalities of consciousness that I, Cormac McCarthy, sorry, uh, have experienced in my life. Because that's what we want to see from McCarthy. We want to hear his thoughts. He is a great thinker. We don't need to get what happened in The Counselor. The Counselor is a great story in retrospect when you look at it as the conclusion of his Western series. Because we start with Blood Meridian and the violence of the West. And we kind of move into the muted destruction of nature after World War II with the Border Trilogy. And then into the new rising violence with No Country for Old Men. And then finally climaxing with... Uh, the counselor with the cartel violence and everything. It goes into in a very beautiful and linear, linear, layer, uh, excuse me, linear progressive arc. But even with the cast of great actors and as someone generally likes films like that, it, there was something missing there. I thought it was an okay movie. I enjoy, I enjoyed watching it. But to the standard I was holding McCarthy, especially with a film like this, it wasn't that great. And now we are here in the present moment where McCarthy apparently worked on the screenplay of Blood Meridian and got a lot of it done and had been working on it since 2013. So when we see the Blood Meridian movie, a lot of it was going to be pushed by McCarthy, which looking at it back at the history, it may be a little bit problematic because as we've talked about a bunch on this channel before, to make the Blood Meridian movie work, it's going to have to be a little bit deeper than just the violence, than just group of scalp hunters goes down there, there's violence, there's these horrific scenes. It's like, that's something that a lot of us have seen before and doesn't really interest me. But a lot of the supernatural polarized elements of the story, including Judge Holden, the idiot, a lot of the frenzy that's happening, what goes on at the end, that is the core. And McCarthy, who seems to want to distance himself from a lot of that era and not wanting to talk about it he may use the same strategies he's employed in his other screenplays of making things too bland but there is a bright side to all of this which is that mccarthy may include a lot of the dialogue it may not be some psychedelic apocalypse now type movie which is what i want but we may get a lot of the best dialogue from the novel from holden and whatnot Because McCarthy appreciates that, from what I can tell, in a lot of his screenplays, like putting these very beautiful dialogues and discussions in there. And so if it was an adapted screenplay, maybe a lot of that would have been axed, because other than a couple pivotal moments, you know, a lot of what the judge is saying is somewhat crazy. And today's topic, as I was talking about earlier, is Judge Holden a seducer or a prophet? And you guys can talk about it for free on the the Right Conscious Substack. I'm going to be having daily posts. We're taking out the Cormac McCarthy subreddit because I can't handle AI art, people posting their book book collection, random questions that no one cares about, and the snobbery that's going on over there. So we're we're, we're taking it back, and I'd love to see you guys over there. Peace.